Well, I guess um, if I start talking to you, we'll start coming in. So, um, so my name is Julian Fitzel. Um, I am the co-creator of the CSF framework. I come from Canada. I've just been in Beijing, which is why I've got the lovely photo of the first time. Uh, and I'm on my way to Germany now, stopping off here. Um, this was supposed to be Lucas's talk originally. He was going to talk about extending CSAC. Uh, and it was suggested that maybe I would give a talk on the history of CSAC. Um, and then it sort of turned into talking about the architecture of CSAC. As you can see, it now says the evolution of CSAC. Um, and basically, what's happened is over the time I've been here, sitting thinking, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how these sides of all over the years have been developed. And hopefully, towards the end, assuming we have time, I think we will, uh, maybe give you a few tips about a few places where you could extend these sides. So it's a bit of a combination of all of those things together. So what I was thinking about while I was here is that it seems to me that we've gone through several phases in Seaside development. And what I'm suggesting is that the pattern I'm seeing is that we've been through a layer or a, a part of experimentation, uh, then a bit of stabilization, we begin to see uh, optimization, and now we're beginning to get into, I think, I hope, we should I'm not saying we've done all the earlier ones, but you know, that's, that's the uh, direction we're moving. So that's my thesis, I'm going to talk about that as we go through. So, experimentation. Um, we're going back here to about 2000. Uh, we were doing development of web objects, which is a framework that came out of Next, and then Apple had it. It was originally an Objective-C, and it's kind of a cool framework. You could uh, build with a UI builder, and it would generate uh, templates, bindings, and you could link form fields with instance variables and buttons and methods. It was pretty good. Um, and then largely because it started moving to Java instead of Objective-C, uh, Avi at the time decided to write a similar framework in Ruby. Uh, it was called Iowa. For interpreted objects for web applications. So Iowa was largely, well, I mean it was simpler. It didn't have everything that web objects had in it, but structurally it was very similar. It was a fairly close port. Um, so it had page objects, and again, you could create a template, you could create bindings, and basically what you're doing is you're binding anchors to methods, you're binding form fields to instance variables, and you're binding tables, table rows, lists, things that repeat to arrays. Um, and I thought I'd just, you know, for the element, I would show you a little example of what that would look like in IO. Everybody can read that? Yes. Dangerous question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Um, so what we have there is a component called main. Uh, we have an accessor, which is an instance variable called person. This is kind of a fictitious example, but it's okay. uh, We have a method called all people, which through some mechanism is going to get all the people and return them. And we have a method called delete person, which again, through some mechanism, is going to delete the person and pass into it. Um, so this, so the top part is the template, and the bottom part would be the binding. Um, fairly straightforward, it's HTML, and basically any tag that's going to be dynamic is going to have some kind of behavior attached to it by Iowa, it's got an OID tag, uh, it's just an arbitrary tag. Uh, so we've got a, a, an unordered list tag called people, and the uh, at sign is kind of a shortcut to say, uh, evaluate this and then print it out as tag. So you see down below in the bindings, the tag that's called people has two parameters assigned. Its item is set to person, so that means that as it's looping over the list, which is all people, uh, each item is going to be put in a slot called person. And so then within the list that's repeating, you get person.first name, person.last name. So that's going to do, each person is going to print out as the list repeats. Um, the anchor also has an OID, which is delete person, and by default that's just going to call the delete person method. And it's going to magically pass in the, uh, no, it's going to look for the um, thing that's bound to item. Whatever is item within that scope is what's going to get passed in <coughs> to that method. If that method was a, if you look back, it's expecting a parameter. <laughs> so that's what 
would have looked like in Ruby. Um, then I guess largely because we stumbled across Smalltalk and started moving to Smalltalk, uh, Iowa really only got to, I think, version 0 0.14, so um, it was sort of dropped fairly quickly, and uh, we had a project that we were doing with implementing a box office ticket sales system, which we were doing in a web format, and so we therefore started porting it to Smalltalk, and that's uh, how Seaside was born. Nice logo, eh? Yeah. Yes? Which year was this? Um, so, uh, if I remember right, I think Ruby or Iowa would have been released beginning of 2001, uh, January 2001, and uh, Seaside just would have been 0 0.9 something, I mean 0 0.9 I think was released at the end of 2001 or maybe the very beginning of 2002, something in that range. Yeah, I should have said ask questions. Ask questions throughout if you want. My opinions. My yes. Um, okay, so we can enterprise operating server. Uh, that is essentially a pun on enterprise Java beans. <laughs> why particularly aubergines? Uh, Avi gets credit for that, and I don't know why that popped into his head, but he thought it sounded, uh, sounded like enterprise Java beans and resulted in kind of a cool acronym. So that's the story of that. Um, I think the Swing Enterprise aubergines is kind of concrete-ish and then server and then integrate or integrated development environment kind of made it into an acronym. So. Uh, there was likely a little bit of beer involved. Either. I don't really remember that well, but <laughs> it seems likely. <laughs> Um, so again, just for curiosity, and this is largely because people on the list seem to be every now and then resurrecting the why doesn't Seaside have templates, but I'd show you what the templates look like in Seaside 0.9. Um, I actually had the opportunity about a year and a half ago to go back and do some extensions to the box office application that we wrote in the original Seaside, <laughs> and was forced to refigure all this stuff out again, and that's challenging. <laughs> so you'll see that this looks very similar to the Iowa one. Instead of OID, we now have CID, and instead of the app, we have square brackets. <coughs> but other than that, it's basically the same. Basically the same template. Um, the bindings look a little different. The bindings are added in a method. So, um, but basically it's the same thing. So the top part is the same one I showed you in the other one. The list is set to all people. The iterator is set to person. So that again, in each loop, which is the current element, they can call it person. And uh, in this case, I've added the uh, binding for the delete link to specifically specify the um, argument that's being passed in. Now, again, in this case, it will be, it would actually work automatically because it's going to look at the last thing that was added to the context. Uh, just to show explicitly what it would look like. So we're generating, you know, for every component, you're doing just tons of these. I mean, you could have 10 dynamic elements on a component or more, and you've got this long list of bindings. Um, you could also get a little fancier if you were to put the CID as person slash all people. That's going to be interpreted as well you know, for each person in all people. A little shorter than you don't need the binding. Um, and just again, to show a few more examples. The that's a conditional and uh, embedding a component. So to embed a component down at the bottom, you would just basically use the name of the component as a tag. Like, you don't have to do that, you could do it in the bindings. You could attach any class, any component class you wanted to any tag in the bindings, but this would be the sort of more direct way. And the one above is uh, conditional, it's got a special if tag, which of course is not really an HTML tag. And just uh, the dots are following the method it calls. Uh, and that as well, you could get even fancier. Any tag could become conditional if the ID was, you know, something equals something, it would then be parsed as being a conditional and become one, even though it wasn't an intake. So that's sort of the architecture of Seaside 0.9, just basically say there wasn't any, just a big blob. And uh, that was really the biggest complaint that people had. There was technically a few pieces in there, but they weren't really separated at all, and they were kind of a the way the dependencies worked, you basically had to use it all together because 
session dependent on the components, and the components dependent on the templates. So there are really no pieces that were terribly useful by themselves. So, um, we decided to do a rewrite, and that was started really again almost as soon as point 0.9 came out. So we did point 0.9 for this application. I think we got through about point 0.94, but as soon as point 0.9 was out, the next few releases were really bug fixes, and in that time, we were undertaking a major rewrite. Uh, that came out, I think we were into 2002 at that point. Um, the main goal there was uh, we wanted to get rid of templates. Uh, we really felt that they were, that as the application grew, they got really big, really just hard to manage. It was too much, too much stuff in there, and uh, it was too much magic. And that's all those things I was showing you to try to get rid of the templates, the equals, and the, all the special IDs. People just didn't, if you tried to dig into the internals, people just didn't get how it worked. It was way too complicated to understand. Um, so we wanted to rewrite it with more layers. It was an architecture that people could really understand, could take pieces bit by bit, and uh, attack them that way. So um, CSI2 was called Borges. Um, I don't have to read the quote. It's a quote from Jorge Luis, Luis Borges from a short story called The Garden of Forking Paths. And the quote seems to apply fairly well as a metaphor for CSI right at the end. If you don't care, that's where, that's where the name came from. Um, and Borges was ported to Ruby as well, so uh, that was basically a direct port, so that is kind of equivalent. What's that? Oh. <laughs> um, so that's kind of uh, a direct port of Seaside 2. I think it's gone in a bit of a different direction at this point, but it is still available somewhere for Ruby. So that's roughly, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here because it doesn't really matter, but just to show, basically it got flipped around so that now you could, at least in theory, take some of the kernel stuff, it worked by itself if you wanted to, the views were on top of that, and components on top of that, and those pieces were really better separated so that you could understand it a little better. Uh, Seaside 2 was the first one to add callbacks, were blocks, so prior to that in, in Iowa and in Seaside 0.9, uh, and in web objects as well, you had to bind your actions. Whenever you click on a link, you had to call a method. So this was a problem that added blocks for callbacks. I uh, also added the HTML render at this point. Um, and 2.3, again, I'm not going to talk about the architectures of all of them, but again, just to see, it's basically the same. Uh, the rendering was moved out up to the top so that it didn't, uh, so that other things didn't depend on it. And yeah, basically just to reshuffle. So somewhere around there, we started to get into what I would call the stabilization phase. Um, there was a lot of experimentation done around how to track state. So initially, anything, any instance variable on any component would have been tracked. And for those not very familiar with C what that means when you hit the back button, that state's going to get rolled back the way it was when they were viewing the page that they're now looking at. <coughs> So initially, all component state was backtracked. No session state was, like on the on the session object. Um, we went through several versions. There was a state holder. There was a state tree. <coughs> this was kind of leading up to 2.2, 2.3, 2.4. Um, and there was work done on modularity. So the session was split up into a whole bunch of pieces so that you could subclass those pieces instead of having to understand the whole thing. Uh, and the rendering API was also dropped in favor of the Canvas API, and that was in 2.5, I think. Um, and the problem there was that the rendering API, where you basically have a render object with a whole bunch of methods on it for generating HTML, got really, really ugly because you had all these versions of you know an anchor with an image, an anchor with an image and a label, an anchor with a label without an image, an anchor with a label and see it, you know, it just kind of, it grew exponentially and it didn't work. So the Canvas API was a new way of looking at that. that I think solved that problem, and now, now I mean, I would use Seaside just for Canvas API, I even forget anything else. So, through, I don't know, I'm going to call it 2.2 to 2.5, 2.6, we're really kind of getting into that. Not so much new features, but just reworking, trying to get things stable so they didn't change as much. Now, around the end of this time was about the time that I stopped working on Seaside actively, it was about 2004. 2005, 
Um, I got a full-time job, not in small talk, and just didn't have the time or motivation. Um, and then around, I guess, the end of, I'm not sure, 2005, going into 2006, so I mean, after the release of 2005, Avi also stopped working on it largely, and uh, Philippe and Lucas took over. And that, I would say, was happily uh, the beginning of the optimization phase, largely. And they've done great work at doing uh, memory optimization, reducing the number of continuations, uh, reducing the size of the context stack, uh, speed optimizations in there, we've got streaming. Um, and so this, this to me, I think, is very important. It wasn't something that we could do early on while we were figuring out the architecture, but at this point, it's now, I don't know, how much faster is it now than 2.8 or 2.7? 6? Well, how was Was that four times? So, we got significant improvements there, and I think that's important. Um, and complexity I'm putting there as well, um, because again, there's been a lot of refactoring, it's not that the code isn't changing, but the behavior isn't changing very much. It's how can we split this up so it makes more sense, how can we split it up so it's more pluggable, how can we do these things, how can we make the metaphors clear, and that's been a lot of the work over the last few years. So it's my suggestion that those phases have existed, they're not necessarily over, they're ongoing, and that we're getting into an adoption phase. Um, I see that because we're now seeing frameworks actually developed on top of C side. Uh, Web Velocity, Seabreeze, Gear. We have various vendors coming on, we've got Glass. A lot of people are now taking this and running with this, building other things on top of it, not just applications, but actual frameworks that are now useful in their own right that are dependent on this. And this, I think, is the phase that we're in that we have to acknowledge, and I think this is very cool. Um, but to help us along, there's certain things we have to do, and that's some of the stuff we're trying to work on now. So portability has been a big, um, big goal for 2.9 and 2.8. Um, there's been a platform class added, and the code for all the different um, different versions, like Squeak and uh, Gemstone and VisualWorks, has been pulled out into separate packages or separate classes, so that it's much easier for someone to support to in your small talk. All they have to implement is those pieces and defining a set of tests that define our base expectations of the system and that kind of thing. Um, documentation is obviously still a weakness. Um, you know, there's books starting to come out. There are people writing far more detailed blog posts. This is something that, frankly, needs more work needs to be done on it, and I think this is something that's really important to do now going forward. There's been a lot of talk on the mailing list about you know, what's, what's going to be in 2.10 or what's going to be in 3.0 or whatever the next version is called. And I'm not sure that it matters if there's no big demand for some feature that someone's crying out for. You know, what's, what's the rush to get a new version? For me, I think what's really important is to get this adoption going. And that means things like documentation. It means things like having a uh, full stack so that we can give recommendations for people. You know, this is what you can use for persistence. It doesn't have to be the only way, but this is the way we recommend this works. This is how you can deploy. This is how this is how you solve these problems and to get a system that people can come in and get going and actually answer those questions. And to me, at this point, I think it's a missed opportunity if we're not taking advantage of that to really push it forward, uh, rather than coming up with some new feature that we need to put in. So this is kind of my key point, my one key point. Um, and advocacy, of course, and that's uh, you know the. Uh, the podcasts that James is doing, and uh, the work that Randall's doing, going around talking to people, uh, a lot of individuals who are going and talking to Ruby groups and so on, all of this is important, and again, something that I think more could be done on. Um, so, having said that, I want to start to do a little, well, maybe documentation, verbal documentation. Um, See if I can explain a little bit about the architecture as it is, a little bit about the metaphors, and hopefully give you a few examples about ways that you can plug into this that maybe you haven't thought about doing. Um, Keyside really was designed to be layered so that you could use different pieces separately and so that you can plug in and change the behavior. And because that's not documented very well, a lot of people are missing those opportunities. Um, before I dive into that, though, are there any questions about anything so far?
Okay, so this is roughly, I would say, what the architecture of Seaside 2.9 looks like at the moment. Um, not really that different from 2.8. To say the main thing in 2.9 is being splitting the code apart into packages. So where they were maybe um, uh, class categories before, they're going to be separate packages now that you can actually choose not to load. So very obviously up the top, there's now a test package. There's an examples package. Uh, development tools package, and none of that needs to be loaded. So if you're doing a deployment image, you don't need to load any of that stuff. That's one less thing you need to worry about in terms of someone being able to get in. Um, as I said, there's a platform class along the bottom, and that needs to be implemented on each platform. Um, it's either you know methods that don't exist on classes in some um, uh, in some distributions or uh, functionality that behaves differently or whatever, and so each each uh, fork would have an implementation of that. There's a whole set of base tools, things like configuration, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, uh, various utilities, exception handling, HTTP request modeling, all that kind of stuff. And then built on top of that, um, basically the so vertically here we're looking at dependencies roughly. So the request handling layer is going to depend base there. Uh, everything that's marked in core currently is all in one core package, and I think we're going to work to actually split these up into um, individual packages. But the, the architecture is going to stay the same. So request handling is responsible for taking a uh, Seaside request object, and that's actually going to be fed in by a server adapter, which is going to take a match request or whatever kind of request coming in and convert it to a Seaside request. Request handling is going to take the request and expect or provide a response back. That's really all it does. Um, it provides the request handler and entry point is a kind of uh, request handler, and it's just a uh, request handler that is registered at um, a URL name. So you, know, you can create one called Seaside. When you go to Seaside in the URL, it's going to go to that request handler. Yeah. Um, so what's the special um, need for a Seaside request? Why can't you just use uh, Uh, mostly portability is the main reason. So we can convert from whatever, not even just between DigitalWorks and Suite, but between Comanche and you know, whatever, whatever other web server you want to use, or if you want to use an HTTP HTTP plugin, which Blake's working on, uh, it gives us an abstraction. We know we're always dealing with the same object. I mean, there are methods on there that we use as convenience methods, but functional and functionality-wise, it's it's just a consistent layer that we can use. Um, so on top of that is, is what I would call the session management layer. You could also call it the application layer. Um, it's going to deal with uh, storing state, um, all your application specific behavior that's not component specific behavior. And again, you can use this by itself. You can use this without components. So you need the request handling layer. But you could create some kind of a, a session. You could create an application that used a session but didn't generate HTML didn't use components and did generate HTML, whatever you want. It's all it's doing is is dealing with a request coming in that has a session key, pulling up that session object which has your state that you stored, um, and I think also dealing with callbacks can also be handled there because the callbacks are coming back uh, into the session. Um, and so every session has a main class, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in one of the examples. Um, but render loop layer implements and it's a subclass of that called render loop main. So it's uh, dependent on that. And the uh, component layer is fairly obvious. Components are things that hold HTML generating code and state. Um, I, there used to be a view class, no, I can't remember what it was called. It was an earlier version of Seaside that had a stateless component basically. And I'm playing in 2.9 with putting that back. So we'll see. At the moment, it's called Painter. And the idea is just that it's a place to hold HTML rendering code when you don't actually have component state. Um, and therefore, you can use it at the lower layers. You could use it, for example, with request handler. So that's what Painter is. Um, Painter doesn't really depend on the canvas. The canvas API is the one I'm saying for rendering HTML. It expects some kind of a renderer 
some sort, but you can pass any object into it and use it. You're just you're calling methods on it. So that's say, not exactly a dependency, but it's expected to be used that way. Um, and component would be a special class painter that handles calling, uh, answering, decorations, uh, and state. So the render loop is going to tie the components and the session together. Uh, and again, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But <coughs> theoretically, you know, you can use components with the session without the render loop. They don't have to be together. They're side by side because they are generally going to be used together. Does that make sense? Are there questions about that? Too technical? Maybe one question. Yeah. Um, you use a uh, kind of streaming protocol, or you stream out HTML. Um, okay, that's a very general question, maybe. So, what's that? Why don't you just use objects with render themselves? Why, why does it need to be a stream? It's a model that doesn't have a model that doesn't understand, so the button is done. You're talking about like streaming the HTTP response, is that what you mean? Why is that done? Yeah, generating the HTML by way of the stream. So instead of having objects manifesting themselves. Why, so why don't we build up a tree first, is that what you mean? Yeah, well, building a tree is probably uh, when you start to see there. <coughs> yeah, just <coughs> take the objects and have them uh, change around without uh, being bound to the screen and have to be serialized in that way. Is this mm -hmm. an answer? Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a WA HTML tree document as an alternate canvas. And I think the reason the HTML stream document is used is for performance reasons. Yeah. And yeah. there are times in our environment, at least with Gemstone for, for performance that they will be discussing, where every time you copy a string, it takes up uh, CPU cycles. Right. And that's something that you can avoid. Yeah, I think the tree, uh, the tree render at the moment, I'm not sure, I think may not actually work as a replacement for the stream. It, it should, or there should be one that does. Um, I think that one's used for generating the pretty printed HTML in the halos. Um, but it was previously, it wasn't streamed. Now it is, and it, it really should, should be both, I guess. Um, but yes, the reason is basically performance. Um, you can render it all first and then output it. But then the browser sits there and waits while you do the whole rendering. If you can stream it to the browser, most browsers will actually start displaying it as it arrives. Uh, so it makes quite a big difference for how the user feels the uh, experience. Yeah. What does the rest What are the two rows? Uh, so the canvas is the uh, the actual canvas API, which is a uh, it's basically a, a class that you call or well, an object that you call. Methods on that generates puts HTML onto the screen, so it's an implementation of the uh, HTML not protocols, not their syntax exactly. Um, and Painter, Painter, it almost has nothing on it. You don't need the Painter. Um, this is one thing that some people may not know. You can add a render on method to any object, pass it to the renderer, and uh, it'll it'll get like you can render it that way. So you don't have to use any particular object, you can have your model objects know how to render themselves if you want. Um, the reason I was trying to do the painter was just because a lot of people don't know this, and so having a class that you can subclass uh, to do it, that you can document, you know, this is the way you do it, makes things a little simpler, and we can find all instances of that to display in the list. Uh, but it has, as implemented now, it has maybe, I don't know, five or six methods on it. It's not, it's not very significant. Okay, so bullet points come up. Oh well, those weren't there before, but they're there now. Yeah. Ignore the bullet points. Um, I think I also reapply the style sheet. Uh, this is a metaphor of CSET, and um, I don't think everybody exactly realizes this, so I thought I'd mention it. Um, CSET is supposed to be writing applications for the web without writing them for the web. It's supposed to be more similar to writing a normal application. So you have an application class. Usually you don't subclass it, but you could if you needed to do a specific behavior. When you, that maps to an application in the metaphor. Uh, whenever you run the application, you're going to create a session. Now the session basically represents how to, 
how to enter in from the request, and then you could call it global state of your application. Um, it, it has a special property that you can backtrack to the back button, which doesn't quite fit in the metaphor because you don't normally do that in a console application. But basically, the session is, you know, what's the global state of your application that's shared? When the session starts, it has, I said, uh, a main class. And as far as I know, everybody is using WA render loop main, which is the only one included in the, the only concrete uh, class included in the in C side distribution. If you, this is basically all that happens when you run a C side application. You start your main, you create a root component, you loop, you render the root component, you, there's a break there, of course, because the user gets it and does their stuff, and then they submit. You get your callbacks back, you process the callbacks, do whatever you need to do, save your data, run your actions, and then a redirect. The redirect is actually optional, and the reason for that is that we want, if you hit refresh, we don't want to redo the actions, we just want to re-update the viewing. So we redirect to a new page that shows you the HTML, and if you refresh, you're not resubmitting the, um, the submitted data. And then loop again, and that's all that happens in the C-side application. So as I said, the main is represented by a class WA render loop main. You can subclass it if you want. The loop is represented by WA render loop. Again, you can subclass it if you want. These two here are encapsulated in WA render continuation. This is not a continuation in the same sense that, you know, a, a squeak or a small talk continuation. Literally, it's more like continuation passing style continuation. So that continuation is going to deal with those two parts of the loop. And that's represented by WA redirect continuation. So any part of those pieces are customizable. What would you do with them? You know, I don't know. Maybe you don't want to do the redirect at all. Maybe you want to log every time you do it. Maybe you want to, you know, whatever. whatever. I mean, the, the, the reason most people don't subclass them is because you don't need to often. But there's a lot of power there in the sense that this is just a very generic mechanism. And this is why you can write applications as, as if you're writing applications, because this is the, uh, you know, this is the implementation of that metaphor. And each of those pieces are available to you if you want to change. If you want to write something that works totally different with session handling, the pieces are there to plug in. That makes sense? Okay. That's fine. Okay. Um, so I have about 10 minutes, and I have a couple of suggestions just of things that you could um, implement that maybe you never thought about doing. Um, Take a couple of questions quickly if there are any. I don't need to get through all of these, so. Okay. Uh, so, just to listen quickly, in case we don't get through all of them, uh, these are some of the common places that we were always expecting that people could plug in and customize where they aren't. Uh, configuration you're supposed to be able to create your own uh, custom configuration, so when you go into the config screen, all those options, you can add stuff, and probably should add stuff in a lot of places for your application. That could be database paths, uh, style sheet configurations, I mean, you name it, anything, anything that you would, you would not want to be hard coding in your application that you want to be able to configure or you want the person to point to be able to configure should be easily able to be plugged in there. Um, and I'll show you an example of how that works in 2.9. It's totally different in 2.8, but the mechanism is basically the same. You can do the same thing. Uh, custom error handlers is something that I think a few people are doing, not that many people are doing. The default error handlers are kind of ugly. Um, and they don't do very much. You might want to send an email to yourself. Uh, you might want to file a bug. You might want to save a snapshot of the image that you can load up later to see the error that came up. Uh, again, the possibilities are fairly open, uh, and it's a very simple thing to do. Um, a custom request handler, uh, obvious example of that. So this is again, this is the lowest layer of that uh, sort of three-layer sandwich. Um, the obvious. Example of that would be if you wanted to implement a REST API. Um, take XML in, XML out, there's no session state. Um, you're just getting the request handling behavior, the ability to nest them in dispatchers and get the URLs built up and all that, and 
CNC sites, uh, machinery. You could use the Canvas API with it if you wanted. Um, don't have to. Uh, there's, there, there would be other reasons you might want to do that too, but that the REST API is the most obvious one. Um, session expiry, that's you in 2.9. Uh, I mean, you could, again, configure it before, but it's much easier in 2.9. Um, and that's what to do when session expires. Maybe you want to, I think, default behavior is to go to the lab and when the session expires, create a new session, but you may want to display an error message. I mean, anything you want to do when someone shows up with an old session key. Uh, and you can write your own toolbar and Halo plugins, the toolbar, the development bar along the bottom. Halos are things that pop up when you. So creating a configuration is always was relatively easy. It's now very easy. Basically, you're going to create a subclass of system configuration. Um, there's system configurations and user configurations. And basically, user configurations are going to hold uh, values that you're setting. They're read-write, whereas system configurations are read-only and are going to define attributes. You need to implement, you only need to implement one method to describe on. Uh, I'll show you an example in a minute. It's fairly similar now to the Canvas API, so it's the same kind of thing, but you're building up a configuration instead of HTML. Uh, you can optionally implement parents, so configurations have, in, have a multiple inheritance mechanism of sorts, so that you're inheriting attributes and values from other configurations. We don't tend to have very deep inheritances, um, but it's there. Uh, you need to do that if you're overriding, if you want to override the value of another configuration, And then you just go into the configuration screen, you choose the configuration you want to add, click add, and all those new options will show up in the, the main part, or in the screen. And just a one note that after your names are, have to be globally unique, so if you're adding your own, you should make sure to prefix them with something unique to, uh, to you. So that's what a thread on looks like now. Let's say it's quite different in 2.8, you can probably figure it out if you're, if you're keen, but in 2.9 it's fairly straightforward. Um, Creating a string attribute called my app, so post. Uh, you can add a label to it, you can add a comment. Uh, I guess I didn't do a default value in there, you can apply a default value to it. Uh, we've got a list, which is my app theme. You can give it a list of options to put in it. Again, defaults, labels, uh, pop up descriptions. That's, I think, about all that's on there right now, but um, you know, it's easy to add more now because it's more, more of a Canvas like API. And um, and then setting a, a deep, or overriding an option from one of our parents, which is shown at the bottom. Uh, there's strings, lists, integers, password fields. Uh, again, not that many types, but they're represented by classes as well. Could be you can add new ones if there's something else. I've been thinking about adding a URL type. Not there yet. But. Somebody started putting their in there. Um, an error handler. Again, very straightforward. Subclass error handler. You can handle error. You're going to get an error passed in. Uh, you can optionally implement handle warning and internal error um, if you want to deal with it separately. And again, go to configuration, choose your error handler. So uh, there's several in there right now. One displays a walk back, one displays uh, shorter. Error message, but it, but there actually probably should be an email one in there by default. That'd be a good thing. Uh, request handler. It's going to be just as simple. You're going to subclass entry point. You're going to handle request. You're going to get passed in C side request object and return a C side response object. And again, I think this would be a very good way of doing REST APIs, that sort of thing. Uh, entry points. As you probably know, have configurations, so that's why your application has a configuration, the dispatchers have configurations, and any new one that you create, you can also have a set of default set of configuration options that they depend on. Um, and then yeah, just go create a new one in the, in the uh, config. I'm not even going to really show this one, it's the same. <laughs> Session key handler, handle request. So, as you can see, there's a lot of places in there that you can take advantage of. Um, I, think, I think we need to go ahead and, and improve the documentation of some of these things. So this is the first step. 
Um, I'm going to be trying to think of, of other ways that we can try to get this information out and get more people using it. And uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Questions? of the CSS to the visual works GUI painter and vice versa. Yeah, I, mean, I, th I think he certainly found that, I don't know about brutal, but no, no, no trivial piece of work. But I mean, it is there, that would be a start point if you wanted to do it now. Sorry. Any others? Well, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I haven't seen anything. I haven't seen a specific technology yet that you know makes me think, oh, it's you know, we're threatened. But I do think that if you don't take advantage of the upswelling when it's there, the paper's off again, and you know, it's it's open source. There's no nothing stopping someone from implementing basically the same thing but a little better, and you know, they have the better publicity, then that one's going to take off instead. So. Uh, so I think the answer is, is for me, the, the biggest risk is just not capitalizing on, on the growth when it's there. And so that's why I say I think the adoption is what we need to focus on now. Um, and anything we can do to grow that while there are people watching um, is, is what we need to do. that answer question? Or, <laughs> you want a specific technology? No, no, no. <laughs> no, no you, should, you should write a book out. What's that? You should write your book. Review your book, not have to review your book. Anything else? No. Okay. Oh. Yes. How do you decide when 2.9 is done? Well, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
2.9 is really about the refactor or about the splitting of packages, and that's largely done. Um, the configuration changes that I did uh, was really just almost scratching an itch. I started fixing a bug, but I ended up realizing that the piece really needed rewriting, so I did that. Um, really, Lucas and Philippe were probably, they, they've been working on 2.9 all the way through. I've only just got back into it in the last few months, so um, I wouldn't presume to be the one who decides when it's done, but I, I think. At the moment, we need to fix a bunch of bugs and uh, you know figure out a way to make it easier for people to load. Because right now, all the packages make it a little difficult to load in. You have to do them all in the right order. And once we get that done, you know we get some kind of release out. I think it's there aren't any other huge goals for for two point nine. I think. Yep. Quick. Of the canvas? Yeah. With the question, are there or could there be? Mm -hmm. What's your question, whether there were branches or whether there could be branches? Uh, well, how do you think that um, it Hopefully, it doesn't have to. Um, uh, we haven't taken the, the attitude of doing that in the canvas. Uh, if you, the canvas is really just generating the HTML tags, and if you know that some tags are going to work in one browser and others not. That's something that you would sort of have to grab. Um, I, I think for the most part, people are doing different CSS for different browsers more than different HTML these days. Um, <coughs> so from the Canvas point of view, I think that's not a huge problem. Um, and the CSS, I mean, that would be another problem if you were modeling the CSS <laughs> rather than text. You then need to provide a way to, to have people do that uh, as well. So um, you could, you certainly could subclass it for two if you needed, but I don't see that being a 